Newton. So tonight we have our first and foremost prayer time, and I encourage you to make every effort to make it intentional to be here tonight. At 6 p.m., we're going to be meeting in the children's suite uh, from now on on Wednesdays for our first and foremost prayer time. And so uh, you're encouraged to be a part of that and participate in that. How deep the Father's love for us. How best beyond all measure that He should give His How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away, as wounds which mar the chosen ones, It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me love I know that it is finished I my ransom so that I might be free, set free from death and the dominion of the evil one, that I might be set free from the power of sin. Temptation is still there, but we've been set free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. Man, if that ever gets old to you, then something is wrong. Um, 
we have to remind ourselves every single day of how great God's grace is and that he drew us, the Father drew us to the Son, and he saved us. We simply responded when we heard the gospel and put our trust in Christ. That should never get old, and it needs to be a daily reminder in our lives because life just crushes in and agendas and plans and the hubbub of life but to take a pause every day and be reminded of God's great grace for us. Today we're picking up in John chapter 8, a very familiar story to all of us, an incredible story. Um, this is the only place in the Gospels where this story is found, and you might note in your Bible that uh, some of the earlier manuscripts do not contain this story, manuscripts that they had found that had been uh, copied from the original uh, but it was later inserted in when other manuscripts were found that, that date a little later. And so we have no question that it, that it took place. And, um, but the editors of the Bible just make that note for us. And it's that story of the woman caught in adultery, caught in the very act of adultery, some translations state. And so let's begin reading. The stanza actually begins in verse 53 of chapter 7. They went each to his own house, that is, after the Feast of Tabernacles, when it was over. It would be the day after the Sabbath. They began to go to their own houses and disperse from Jerusalem. Uh, but Jesus remained there, and he went up to the Mount of Olives. And if you can picture Jerusalem, the Temple Mount would have would have been here, and across the valley would, would be the Mount of Olives that would be there. And so Jesus often goes to the Mount of Olives to spend time in prayer with the Father. And this is not the only account that we have in the Gospels of him doing that. So Jesus had gone there to the Mount of Olives, and then early in the morning he got up and uh, would have gone again to the temple grounds. And it was not uh, unusual for Jews to go every morning to the Temple Mount. As a matter of fact, they still go there every day, not actually to the Mount, but to the Wailing Wall, which is the eastern wall of the temple grounds, there to say their morning prayers. And so Jesus goes there again to the temple, and all the people came to him. Evidently, there uh, had been many that were, their hearts were pricked by his words and his teaching. They had never heard a man teach like Jesus did. They never heard a rabbi teach the way that Jesus had taught. And so there was a draw. There is a draw to the words of Jesus. Um, but, but it either repels one or it draws one. And if one has a heart, uh, inclined as the Father is drawing them, they'll hear the words of Jesus. And there are no other words recorded like the words of Jesus in all of the history of literature. And so John tells us that they came to Jesus here, and Jesus sat down, and Jesus began to teach them. Uh, it doesn't indicate what he was teaching them here, but evidently he was probably teaching them uh, the revelation of Messiah and how it had been prophesied. And so he's teaching them in verse 3. It says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in his midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. And some translations translate that, and the, 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 um, in the Greek it is it's there, in the very act of adultery. So if you can picture, here's a, here's a woman, and she's been caught in the very act of adultery. Uh, the question that comes to mind uh, is where was her partner in this act of adultery? Because it takes two uh, to commit this act. And you might assume that they probably evidently uh, made way that the man could have escaped or perhaps they let him go. And they brought the woman to Jesus. This kind of gives some indication as to how women were treated in that day. Uh, they were a very uh, low class in the social structure. And one of the things that Jesus broke was that, uh, that status of women, and he, he spoke against that. We were created equal in the image of God. And so here they bring the woman to Jesus, and they throw her down in front of him. And perhaps she was still even naked, we don't know, or maybe had a cloth over her. Nevertheless, it was a very embarrassing moment for her, and they probably intended that situation. They could have held her privately uh, and gone to Jesus and explained it, but they humiliated her. They wanted to humiliate her by throwing her in front of Jesus, perhaps 
for effect. Verse 5, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So uh, what do you say? And if you look back in the law, it was not only the woman that was to be stoned, but the man was to be stoned as well. And uh, so, again, just kind of their disdain, I guess, if you will, their sense of superiority over women. They, they just brought the woman there and threw her down in front of Jesus. And then John says in verse 6, they said this uh, to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Now, this was certainly a trap for Jesus because while the Jews were under Roman law, the Romans forbid the Jews from executing anyone. And so if Jesus had, had said, yes, uphold the law and execute her, then he would have been guilty of violating the civic law of Rome at the time. And he could have been uh, charged by the Romans for this, of causing an insurrection or murdering, executing, uh, commanding capital punishment uh, and, uh, and uh, violating the Roman law. And if Jesus had said, simply let her go, then to the Jews, Jesus would have been violating the law of God. But instead, Jesus stoops down and he begins to write with his finger in the sand. We're going to see later, there's a second time that after he had spoken to him, he kneels back down and begins to write in the sand. We don't know what Jesus was writing in the sand. There's a lot of speculation. And I tend to think that perhaps Jesus, the most plausible thing may have been that Jesus was writing the commandments in the sand, uh, writing the Ten Commandments of God in the sand. We don't know. We can only speculate, but that seems to be what might be most plausible. Um, the other held view is that maybe he was writing their sins in the sand that they would identify and know were sins that they had committed. Either way, uh, Jesus is writing in the sand. And verse 7, as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now we need to pause and think about this. Um, Jesus is saying, listen, if you are without sin, then you are in a place to condemn this woman. Um, and let any of you who can claim to be without sin be the first one to cast a stone at her. Um, Jesus is pointing out that the reality is there's not a single one of us that is without sin. And who are we to judge another one because of their sin? We do that a lot, don't we? Uh, there are different reasons we might do that, but I think the, the, the greatest reason in my experience has been that there's typically something in our own life that we're aware of that we're either wanting to justify or cover up. And we all like to have that sense of superiority over others. I'm more righteous than you. And we get into this game and this trap in the body of Christ where um, we not only judge one another, Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. And so we have a tendency uh, in that sense to want to raise, elevate our own righteousness when the truth is every one of us at the foot of the cross stand equal. We, we have all sinned and we're all guilty of sin. There's not a one of us that is not guilty of sin. And so Jesus says, listen, if you're without sin, then you go ahead and condemn this one. Now, there's a difference between uh, we're called to judge one another in the body of Christ, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians, meaning that, that we're called to lovingly confront a brother or a sister who has fallen. We're exhorted. Uh, James tells us that if we if we if we confront in that, then we've rescued another believer. And so, but we've got to understand the attitude and the heart behind that is a heart of love. If I see my brother in sin, I need to go to them and lovingly uh, say to them, "Listen, I recognize this, and it's my love and my care and my concern for you that I'm." asking you to wake up and to repent of that sin. Very big difference in the attitude. We as Christians often as well like to judge those outside of the body of Christ, those who have not been saved. And Paul, again, corrects that church in Corinth and 1 Corinthians 
not to do that. God is the one who's judge of them. And so we have no place to judge whatsoever. I think one of the greatest devices used by the enemy is to, is to exploit the body of Christ, judging the world who do not know. Paul says, listen, we're, how do we expect them to act any different? They're unsaved. They have not been regenerated. If we think they can do better, then we're, we're promoting morality rather than righteousness in Christ. And so we as the body of Christ need to be very aware, and I see it all the time on social media by Christians, and it's a shame. It's a shame that, that we we condemn the lost world uh, through our social media posts and oftentimes uh, verbally to them. That is the greatest device. The enemy uses that uh, to, to cause those who are outside of the body of Christ to, 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 to just be repulsed by the Christian community. And you know what, quite frankly, I don't blame the lost world for being repulsed by those actions of the Christian community. And so be mindful uh, of how you interact with the world. I call social media electronic hand grenades. It's easy to stand behind a bush. It's easy to sit behind a computer terminal and post these, these critical things of the world. Listen, we're called to be salt and light. We're called to plant seeds, cultivate seeds, and reap the harvest. Uh, and we're not called to condemn. God is the only one has that, who has that that right and that place because he is the only one without sin. And that's the second thing Jesus is pointing out here, that none of us are without sin. So we're not in a place to judge. God is the only one. Jesus is the only one who is without sin. And he alone is the only one who can judge. So verse 8, once more after this, he had said that he, he bent down and began to write on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Uh, when they heard what Jesus had said, if you're without sin, then cast the first stone. And they began to drop their stones. Now, there's two, two, two things that could have happened here. Either one, they may have recognized that none of them were without sin, but I think that that perhaps may not have been it because there's indications that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't let up at all after this. I think they realized that Jesus had caught them in a trap and they knew that uh, he had recognized their ploy and they dropped their stones and went away. They thought they had him. They thought they could have condemned him. Later, they'll condemn him, but only at the time the Father had permitted by his will. It was not yet Jesus' time. And they dropped their stones and they walked away. And then I love this. Woman, where are they? In other words, where are those that were accusing you? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on, sin no more. There's a lot we could say about this one phrase of Jesus. But I just want to point out that the Bible says that uh, for those who trusted Christ, that there is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so no matter what your past sins might have been, if you've trusted Christ, there's no condemnation. What your current sin might be, there's no condemnation. God loves you and he wants you to repent of whatever that might be and turn to him and hear the indication. That's what he's telling this woman. Listen, turn, repent, and go and sin no more. Um, I pray that the Lord gives us opportunity. Let's ask him that we might be able to um, plant a seed of the gospel today, cultivate a seed, or if God by his grace would allow us to be able to participate in the harvest of one coming to Christ. I look forward to seeing you tonight, 6 p.m., for our corporate prayer time, first and foremost, in the children's suite. Uh, just a heads up, if it's raining, you might want to park on the other side of the church so you can come in that entrance there. But be there and let's be ready to pray. Uh, bring a verse, uh, bring a prayer, and let's petition God. Let's call on Him. I love you and I pray the Lord's blessings on you. Have a great day.